Hello YouTube, this is Bubs Comics coming at you with a quick comic haul. Um, this one's going to be a little bit difficult for me, so uh, bear with me if I'm not my usual joyful self. Um, I took a trip this weekend. Uh, it was important to me. It was something I really wanted to do. I, I wanted to go to Bonnet's Bookstore in Dayton, Ohio. Um, it was something I planned uh, first part of the summer. I wanted to go there and see all the great golden age books and kind of, you know, I like history. I like um, golden age books and I, I like comics and, you know, Bonnet's Bookstore has been around since 1939, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I spoke with the owner. Uh, I've been communicating with him uh, back and forth via Instagram. Uh, because he he primarily works at the bookstore and that's it that's like all he does um, as far as work goes so he has to keep odd hours so he opens the store anywhere from 3 p.m. to like 5 p.m. and then he's open anywhere from 9 p.m. until close and that could be like you know 10 11 12 you know 1 in the morning whatever it may be so he's pretty dedicated um, it was his grandfather's store Originally, his grandparents owned the store back in 1939, and uh, he's the grandson, of course, and he's been uh, taking care of it and, and running it and loves it. Uh, but, of course, it's a big job. Um, it's a great shop. Lots of vintage books and uh, paper, you know, pretty much anything paper. He does have some movies and DVDs and things, but it's kind of like a catch-all store of media at this point. Uh, of course, originally it was it was a comic store. It was, you know... It was a, they called it a magazine store, but it was basically a comic shop. Um, and the whole thing used to be filled with comics. Now it's a relatively small amount of comics. Most comic shops probably have more than this comic book than this bookstore has. It's in a historic part of Dayton, Ohio, called the Oregon District, or Oregon, as they say it there. Um, it's the Oregon District, and um, it has nice kind of romantic. It has kind of a romantic look to it. Uh, very old city um, looking of course you know like I said the shops have been in the same spot since 39 so very old city um, portion of the city brick streets a um, lot of original storefronts uh, just a really really nice place you can tell it's it's very very well kept up and and meant to still look the way it used to so it's very cool um, so originally I thought I would go by myself on this trip uh, I didn't plan it exactly um, I just knew a general ballpark time I wanted to go and I knew I pretty much wanted to go in August um, so I invited my wife to go with me I said you know it's about a from where I am in Kentucky it's about a four-hour drive roughly um, bad traffic a little more good traffic a little less so I invited her to go with me and uh, asked, you know, do you want to make a thing out of it? And she said, sure. So I booked a hotel room uh, for August the 2nd, I suppose, um, uh, for, for that evening. Is that right? Uh, let me take a look real quick. Uh, no, I booked it for August 3rd. So hotel room is for Saturday night. So the plan was to come to drive up to Dayton uh, Saturday morning and... Um, you know, relaxed, make a relaxed trip out of it because I didn't want it to be a big deal. I have a close friend who lives in the Dayton, actually lives in Dayton. Uh, so we were going to meet he and his and his girlfriend for um, supper, so or for drinks, whatever. So basically, the point was to go to the bookstore, um, and then whatever else happened happened. So <laughs> that's the idea. Uh, so we got to Bonnet's bookstore around um, five o'clock or so um, the fella that owns it said he was going to be opening around four so it worked out so we got there around five I did pick up some books uh, I'll show those first uh, before we go on about anything else that occurred uh, so the first thing is that I picked up a couple of books that already had bonnet stamps on them uh, the first one and the one I'm kind of happiest maybe the second happiest but it's, it's a toss-up is uh, wings number 74 you see that there 
that is wings number 74 and I'm trying to show you where that bonnet stamp is right across the old sky hag there so I think is fantastic I, I think it's a lovers um, yeah Bob lovers uh, cover so let me check that out looks pretty cool Madam hell Hawk my damn hell Hawk <laughs> so pretty cool uh, very happy to have that I wanted this uh, I wanted to get a golden age book that was already stamped that was kind of key on my list next we have uh, Andy Panda <laughs> so this is funny to me my, my wife and I recently went on a vacation and we took a kayaking trip on the vacation and it's the first time the two of us have ever been in the same kayak and this is pretty much how it went so <laughs> <laughs> the two of us, you know, struggling to get the thing to run together. Uh, if if or when we ever go kayaking, otherwise we're in separate kayaks, so we we have a pair of them. So uh, you see the little sawfish cutting off the thing. So anyway, that that just reminded me of the two of us uh, kayaking. So I had to pick this up. Uh, the prices were fairly reasonable. Uh, he's a pretty good guy. Um, not no kind of really haggling situation. He had already priced them pretty reasonably, and that's what you should expect to pay uh, the prices you see. Uh, next, I picked this book up, and I actually, when I walked in, I told him, I said, "Every book I buy today, I'd like to have stamped." And he said, "We don't use a stamp anymore." <laughs> and uh, he talked about how people complain about the stamp, and that when he first took over the shop. And people started getting back into like golden age collecting. Um, there was a lot of hate thrown at him over the, the use of the stamps. Uh, apparently, the um, stamps were, you know, I mean, like anything else, you got. If this was a more valuable, say, golden age book, the bonnet stamp of all stamps is huge. Like I've seen store stamps that were just a small little piece of writing or maybe two lines. The bonnet stamp has like the entire address of the shop. It has, you know, it's huge. It's a huge, huge stamp. Um, and so people get pretty upset that there's some great historical books out there and they have a huge ink stamp on them and people get upset about, you know, the, uh, the defamation of the cover. Uh, personally, I quite feel quite the opposite about it. I think store stamps and um, date stamps and things of that nature, and I like signatures on books too, uh, I think that they make the book a little unique, and they give it, what well, I think they call it provenance. Uh, the idea that you know that at some point this book passed through a certain location. And that, to me, that's ultimately, ultimately what it means. When I get a low-grade anything, key or whatever it might be, signed, I get it signed because it adds a piece of history to the book that says this book wasn't just printed and put on the press and run out and then, you know, a hundred people have owned it over its lifetime or possibly less if it's a newer book, of course. Uh, but it also says that at some point this book was in the hands of one of its creators. And one of those creators took the time to commemorate that by signing it. And then it moves on and it has another life after that. But there's always going to be a piece of its history that is now indelible on the book. And I like that. And to me, a store stamp or a date stamp also provides some of that, uh, especially a store stamp. Uh, some store stamps I don't like, <laughs> some I do. I guess that's just part of being a collector. You kind of learn what you like and what you don't like. Bonnet stamps I've always liked. I like the name. I like that it reminds me of a hat, you know, a bonnet. Um, I always thought it was pretty cool. Uh, and then when I found out that they were so close to me, you know, a four-hour drive, I made it kind of a little personal uh, pilgrimage for me to go there and buy a book that was there to see the shop myself. And so I picked this book up. I think it is Wings 53. And the reason that I say I think is because it's missing the cover. So this is a coverless book. Uh, this is maybe, I don't know, one of my favorite uh, hauls or one of my favorite books from this haul. And the reason is, is that even though it's missing the cover, you can see there, um, it is a Lee Elias book. So you get some great Lee Elias art there. And I think that's awesome. And I had the shop owner put a, a fresh bonnet stamp on there. I had him look out, find a, he had to dig through a pile of stuff to get to the bonnet stamp. 
and then he had to find a working ink pad and it was, it was a little bit of a process uh, but I really wanted these books stamped and uh, he understood why uh, although he was bucking at first saying I, I don't want to stamp some of these books because it's everyone fusses at me for all the books that have been stamped in the past and he of course he didn't do it his grandfather did it you know uh, and most books that were say by the 60s were already not being stamped for sure but anyway another reason that I like it is because of this number five up here and I my guess is that this book has been coverless for quite a long time um, which I think is also really cool because you tend to think that these books just lo just lost their cover you know the cover you just lost it uh, but you didn't because this book has an original five which I assume was probably five cents um, and that handwriting was confirmed by the owner of the shop as being his grandfather's handwriting. So this is the original owner of Bonnet's Bookstore has written this five on this book. So it has been without its cover for a very long time. I think that's really awesome. Uh, and then I have a fresh Bonnet stamp on there, which I think looks great. And it's a Lee Elias interior splash. So, uh, you know, uh, this is, I love this. This, I absolutely love this. This book is freaking awesome, and it will be one of my cherished books in the collection because of all the things it has going on with it. And if I'm real good, someday I'll write on the back of it so I don't forget all this great stuff, right? Uh, here is a book I couldn't pass up for the price he had. Uh, this is another book that I had him to stamp. The, the rest I had him stamp. So only the Andy Panda and the First Wings book were already stamped. Uh, that I found in the racks. The rest I had him to stamp, and some of them I even stamped myself. He let me use a stamp, so I thought that was cool. Uh, this one's a Blue Bolt, uh, number 102. So a nice little LB Cole cover there. And I'm showing you the, the artwork part because the rest isn't really, you know, pertinent. So it's got some writing, you know, some uh, text missing at the bottom. But other than that, it's pretty solid. And check out that bonnet stamp, which is terrible. This is the first one we stamped. And I figured you couldn't hurt this book any more than an in this thing. Every time we touch it, another piece falls off it. <laughs> so it's pretty rough. It's got this whole corner cut out. And it's cut out like multiple, like multiple pages are cut in this book. So really, really rough. But if you're buying it just for the LB Cole cover, I think you got to win there. So there you go. Uh, bonnet's. Bond stamp on that, of course. This was a book. This is a modern book. He died laughing about this. He was like, really? You want me to stamp that? I mean, dude, I'm at Bond's bookstore. You know, the most famous, to me, the most famous stamp out there is a bonnet stamp. You see, in the books that I come across, Golden Age, there will be a bonnet stamp on such a wide variety of, of Golden Age books. I couldn't help myself. So here's a nice modern book. It's Flash 211. I've been after this book because it is a um, a Michael Turner um, flash. So that's a cool Michael Turner cover. I really like it. And I've been wanting this book. So when I saw it there, I couldn't pass it up. And um, it's got a nice little bonnet stamp. And that was uh, one he put on there. So pretty cool. The bonnet stamp didn't come out perfect. But kind of what I like about the bonnet stamps is usually they're they're largely illegible. So you kind of have to be able to recognize it, you know. And these all have the classic layout because the stamp that he used is the last remaining of one of the original stamps. So it may not have been a stamp from 1939, but of the bonnet stamps, when they were actually using the stamps to stamp each book that went through, which, like I said, definitely was over by the 60s. So somewhere in the 40s and 50s, this is, is when this stamp is from. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so I had him do this one. I, I thought that I had all of these um, Challengers of the Fantastic. So I thought I had all these Amalgam books, but I guess I don't because either I didn't put this in my system, in my cataloging system or something, but I didn't have this book anywhere. So, But now I do. So there you go, uh, Challengers of the Fantastic. And there's a little sloppy little bonnet stamp on there. Looks great. So I like those Amalgam books. Uh, next is a book I found there. It's a Shadow Number no. One. This is a book that I've had in my collection before and sold because uh, it was a high grade copy of it, and you know I wanted to make some money, so <laughs> so I could buy other books. 
And so I ended up buying this book kind of back, and it's back in the collection. So very happy to have that. And that bonnet stamp I put on myself, I'm pretty sure. Uh, these next two I put on myself. So that one I was happy with. I thought it turned out pretty good. Liked my placement on it. Didn't want it to be exactly perfect. Here's another one I was real happy with. It's the West Coast Avengers 45. Here's another modern book. No reason to put a stamp on it, but I why not? You know, it's a dollar book anyway, and, and why not put a stamp on it and make it, to me, priceless. So <laughs> here is uh, the Avengers. Got a big old hole in it right there. Uh, the Avengers 45, New West Coast Avengers 45. So this is the first appearance of the White Vision. And there's a little crooked bonnet stamps on there. I like that. Pretty cool. So there you go. Uh, and the last book that I picked up, this was tied for the big book to me. Uh, I was very happy to get it. And I think the bonnet stamp turned out best on this book. So it was all good. And this is... Um, I don't know what to call this, <laughs> but it's limited collector's edition. So basically, it's a treasury uh, of Batman. Look at that. Batman treasury edition. Now you know why I'm on the big screen here. <laughs> and look at how good that bonnet stamp turned out. That's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. Because often the bonnet stamp would be that way. The very center is always a little light. If you're lucky, the top bonnets looks perfect. The Dayton, Ohio on the bottom will look perfect. And then you'll have some perimeter and just faintly be able to read the center. That to me was a perfect stamp, perfect placement. I absolutely love it. Um, this book is not a particularly hard book to find. Uh, you can get it, but be wary because the back has this cut out diorama and often kids cut these out. So, I mean, if I had bought this as a kid, I would have definitely cut this out and played with it and had it in my room and it would have got taped a hundred times and ultimately thrown away probably so glad to have this now i won't be cutting it out but <laughs> pretty fun pretty cool little uh, diorama on the back of these so there you go so there's my limited collector's edition right of batman so with the tabletop diorama intact in the back so there you go so that's my haul uh if all you care about you can turn the video off from here on out uh, tried to keep it under 20 minutes success uh, for that portion of the video uh, now we'll talk a little bit about what happened while I was there so I went to we went to the bookstore my wife and I we at first we checked into the hotel we stayed at the Crown Plaza Hotel uh, which is in the Oregon district Oregon district uh, about four blocks away from the bookstore uh, just at the opening to the Oregon district and so um, we, we checked in, we made the drive, we checked in, we walked over to the bookstore, I bought all these books. My friend calls me and tells me that he's, you know, in the Oregon district, went to a pub called a, a bar, you know, restaurant called the Troll Pub, which is just behind uh, the main East 5th Street of the Oregon district. And so uh, we finished the bookstore, again, the guy was awesome. Um, at the end of the video, or maybe in the beginning of the video, uh, try and put in some pictures of the bookstore uh, that we took. Uh, but anyway, it was fantastic. Um, so we met my friends at the um, Troll Pub. We had supper or dinner or whatever and a few drinks and enjoyed ourselves. And I had got tickets. Well, he, he also. We, we had got tickets to the comedy club uh, Wiley's, which is just behind Fist, uh, East 5th Street as well. Um, well, at the Troll Pub, my wife and also my friend's girlfriend could not finish their food. So, <laughs> so we had these uh, we had these to-go plates, right? And we had a little mini fridge back at the hotel. So, after we ate at the Troll Pub, we all walked over to the hotel before going to the comedy club. So we dropped off the food in the in the hotel. Everybody freshened up or whatever. We went back out to the comedy club. Went to the comedy club. Had a great time. Everybody enjoyed themselves. The show ended somewhere probably around 11 or so. So about an hour and a half show. It was great. Um, so we started walking through the Oregon District around 11 o'clock. Uh, we walked 
you know, in front of all the usual pubs and all the stuff they had there and kind of soaking in. It was pretty busy. Uh, lots of people there. They just had a big festival Friday night, so there was a, there had been a lot of people there the night before as well. Uh, and it's a lively downtown area with many bars and, and really nice, quite nice atmosphere. And one of the things that struck me about the area was how diverse it was. Very, very diverse area. Um, more nationalities than I've seen in like a four block area uh, than I can remember, really. So that was really nice. You know, being from New York City myself, I, I've always enjoyed seeing a lot of diversity uh, in piled in together, you know, and everybody getting along and everybody being friendly. And I was surprised by that as well. Everyone you pass in the street was very friendly. They said hello. Anyway, I took it to be a pretty cool place. And I was thinking to myself, and I think I'd even remark to my wife that, you know, we should come back here every now and then because this is really cool. Uh, and the hotel was reasonably priced, and my friends lived there, and it worked out. And I love the bookstore. You know, I'm like, yeah, let's book another comedy uh, or uh, comic hall, you know. <laughs> let's, let's get over there. So anyway, um, we went back to the hotel, and we dropped off the food. Uh, before we went to the comedy club, right? And we went to the comedy club, we got that done. And then we, around 11 o'clock, we went, we walked back to the hotel. My, my friend had had some car trouble and, you know, all this other stuff. So he was very tired. He had basically worked a bunch. Um, he had even worked that day. Uh, he works hard. So he was really tired. So we kind of wanted to go ahead and close up the night. So we went back to the hotel around 11 o'clock and got there. We were there at like 11.10. I mean, it's super close. Ten, less than 10 minutes away from the comedy club so we got back to the hotel they picked up their food and they left um pretty much and they called an uber and and they went home so you know my wife and i we had already walked quite a bit that day and i don't know that we ever even talked about going back down there uh back down to east east fifth street uh, in the oregon district we just we just kind of tucked it in for the night and, uh, you know, you know me, I admired all my pretties, you know, <laughs> looked at all my stuff. And, you know, we stayed up. We were probably up till maybe midnight or so. We stayed up and then we crashed. We were tired and I had two big buckets of margaritas and a few beers. So I was ready to, to crash. So we crashed. Uh, anyway, in the morning, about 7 o'clock in the morning, I get up uh, to do what people do at 7 in the morning. And... There's a note from the hotel slid into my door, and I'll read it to you real quick. It's what it said, you know. It said, uh, from the Crown Plaza in Dayton, it says, With great sadness that I announced that there was an, inc and that there was an active shooting in the Dayton, Oregon district early this morning where several people were injured and lost their life. Uh, there were police in the vicinity at the time of the shooting, and they reacted immediately by killing the suspect. The hotel was notified and immediately placed on lockdown. So the, our hotel was on lockdown. It's not as dramatic as it sounds. Uh, we take the safety and security of our guests very seriously. And the city of Dayton has set up a Dayton Convention Center as the information hub, which is literally attached to the Crown Plaza Hotel. So at this point, I'm like, uh, so I start walking outside and it says, as additional information becomes available, uh, we will share it from the front desk. So uh, we, so I went to the window and I'm looking outside and there's like ambulances and tons of police cars and um, basically the FBI and the local police had, actually the local police had set up kind of like an information center in the convention center across, like a skywalk across from the hotel I was staying in. And the reason they had done that was because they weren't releasing any information via the media about who was injured, although I did turn on the news and I saw that at that time there had been 10 people shot and killed. Um, the shooter makes, or nine people shot and killed, and the shooter made 10 because he was shot and killed by the police. And then also there were 26 or seven people injured at that time as well. And they weren't releasing the names of the shooter or the other nine people who died or any of the people injured. So basically, they said, if you're missing somebody and somebody hasn't come home yet this morning and you know that they were in this area, you need to come all the way down to the convention center and speak to the authorities before they will tell you if the person you're looking for is either injured or dead or they don't know anything about it. 
So <laughs> it's like, holy cow. So that's what all the hubbub was. They had all the streets taped off, and basically we were stuck in the hotel. Um, we were waiting. You know, I, I woke my wife and told her what was going on, and we were waiting kind of for more instructions. We never heard any more instructions. The hotel never contacted us again, never took us off lockdown or anything like that. I'm not complaining. It's a minor inconvenience. But it was kind of like odd, you know. So I was like, okay. Um, you know, we did the breakfast thing, and, and we um, eventually left. I communicated with the uh, bookstore uh, owner, the Bonnets Books. He was concerned about us because he knew that we were going to be staying in the area. He actually was in the, um, uh, the, in the bookstore. Uh, the shooting happened at 1 in the morning, roughly. And uh, so we had missed it by about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, we were in the hotel during that time, so we weren't there for that, thankfully. Uh, it's about a half a block away from the bookstore. It's it's literally in front of the entrance to the comedy club that we were going to. It's like, you know, half a block away from that, too. Kind of, there's like a gated area. And it's funny is that at the bar that it happened at, or outside of, um, we passed by there, and I don't think I would have ever been in that bar because we we saw a lot of the bars in the area and that was the only bar that I was like, I'm not going in that one. You know? <laughs> that one doesn't look very good of all the other nice bars here. I would steer clear of that one. And then my friend who lives in Dayton, he was, as we were walking by with him, he was like, yeah, you can go to any of these bars you want, but I wouldn't go to that one. It's not a great one. So anyway, chances are we wouldn't have been anywhere near that bar for very long other than just passing by it. Although we did walk by, I mean, we literally walked through the active shooting area probably six times uh, in the span of that evening. So, you know, everybody can speculate and what could have been and had we done this differently, had we not done this this differently. That's why I mentioned the food, because as I, in my mind, go back to all the things that could have changed the course of events, the thing that sticks out to me the most was the food, because if if my wife and her girlfriend and his uh, and my friend's girlfriend had finished their meal and or not taken a doggy bag however you want to look at it then we probably would not have gone back to the hotel and even if we and if we had not gone back to the hotel or they had not brought food back to the hotel then they wouldn't have had a reason to go back to the hotel after the comedy event so if they hadn't gone back to the hotel after the comedy event, we probably would have stayed at some of those bars because we were still wide awake. It was my friend that was pretty tired. We were fine. Uh, we probably would have stayed down and had another drink or, you know, bar hopped uh, for a while and very well could have been there at the time of the shooting. Not, maybe not at that bar, but in the area for sure. And uh, to my understanding, the shooting didn't even occur in the bar. It was like in the street area, in, a, in an area around that bar. So... Anyway, that's that's what happened uh, from my perspective and what I pieced together. Kind of kind of a different thing, you know. I, I don't usually make comments about things like this. Um, I, you know, my channel is about comics. If you're looking for politics or you know prayer or anything like that, is you know that happened around these events, um, you probably have to look somewhere else. Um, I don't do, I don't get too heavy into that kind of stuff. Not on this channel anyway. Um, but it was hard because I like, well, I want to show my comics off and I can't really show, <laughs> like if, if I, if I did just a comic haul, you know, over here where no, um, you know, no, no camera facing me or anything like that. If I just did a comic haul, just a comic haul. And showed all these bonnets books, and everybody sees the Dayton, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio stamp on every one of these books. The question would be raised: Wait a minute, were you there this weekend? Were you just there? And you know, the whole chat or the whole uh, comment section would be, I assume, would be filled with a bunch of people just asking, "Well, did, what happened?" And oh, I don't know how you know how'd it go. And so I figure I'll just answer it now instead of waiting to answer it comment by comment. Uh, and you still comment with questions if you want, but this is probably all I know. Uh, and so anyway, it kind of taints the haul a little bit for me and, and the experience because up until this morning when I woke up and heard the news, read it in, in a paper shoved under my door, then I didn't think anything, you know, it was great. And, and we were like, we should come back, we should do this again. 
you know, this will be fun. We kind of make it a routine to come back every now and then. But now, honestly, probably won't. You know, I mean, that's a shame, but it won't have that same positive romantic feeling, you know, to go back again um, after this happening. So that's kind of a shame, kind of a bummer. But, you know, for, for all the people that are affected by this, uh, I can't claim to be affected most. So that's fine. You know, I'll take this as a consolation prize. You know, I survived, I'm fine, and, and everyone I, that I know directly and care about are fine. So I can't, I can't complain about the inconvenience of having my nice little romantic day, you know, tainted by, by an event like this. So I can't complain about that. Uh, I know that this comes on the heels of another mass shooting in El Paso. I know there's been some, a few videos that I've seen already about that. Um, that, again, I'm not really that kind of guy when it comes to this channel or, or comics to, to make a lot of broad political or, or religious or, you know, call to action type of videos or statements. Uh, I have a very different view, um, from a lot of the views that I've heard so far on other videos. It doesn't make their views or their videos less valid. It's just different. Um, for me, I don't really harp on on the the bad stuff. Uh, I don't think that you know gun violence is out of control. I mean, of course it sucks. Uh, I don't see this as mental illness or anything like that. I see it as crazy people. You know, <laughs> I mean, I know it's I know it's almost too simple, right? Like, how can someone be this simple in this day and age? But to me, you're freaking nuts. You take a gun and you shoot. I mean, I guess it's a little bit of a Bronx, the Bronx comes out in me uh, sometimes, but it's like you take a gun, you shoot a bunch of people, you're crazy. End of story. Uh, were you crazy your whole life? What were the events that made you crazy? Uh, you know, I don't know, and I, honestly, I don't care. I hope there's never a bio biography about you, because I don't care what made you crazy. You did it, you're crazy, and you shouldn't have done it, you know? Does it make you evil and bad and all that stuff? Well, what you did certainly was bad and evil and crazy and... You shouldn't have done it. And now that now that, that person's dead, there's no repercussions, you know, for that person anymore. Ramifications not much in the in the physical world. So what can you do? But here's what I know. I know that until that happened, I saw this area as encouraging. I saw this area as a bunch of diverse people getting together and having a good time. Um I didn't see it as bad or dangerous even. Uh, I noticed while we were walking through there that there was like a cop on every side street. Literally every side street had another patrol car with cops in them and outside of them. Very, very heavily policed area. And yet no problems with the police and the people. So, you know, you come from a big city, you see problems with police. Sometimes too much police can be a bad thing in certain areas. I've seen that myself. But... In this case, the police and the people there that were having a good time all seemed to be harmonious. It, it was quite, that was my biggest takeaway from the area and why I was so eager to return. But honestly, I don't think that that is as rare as people try to make it out to be. Um, if everyone that owned a gun was going to kill, you know, 10 people or 9 people uh, at some point in their life, there would be one of these shootings three or four times a day. Um, if everyone with mental illness went out and, you know, killed a bunch of people, again, you know, you're talking multiple instances a day in every city, not just in a, all the world or all America, in every city, in every compact, in, a, in every large populated area, we would see multiple, multiple killings and death and shootings. It's my, it's my belief and my affirmation that in general, people are good. Uh, when I hear videos and people talking about how the country's gone crazy and the, everyone's tearing each other apart and everything's just falling apart, I just don't see that. I think that there have always been people doing bad things and the level of hypersensitivity that we have now in immediate media attention is relatively new. Uh, and 
this extreme, you know, you don't have to wait for a reporter to get on the scene. Everyone's a reporter. <laughs> you know, everyone is telling the story as it happens. You don't just have one eyewitness that is read about in a newspaper. You have a hundred eyewitnesses that are streaming it live, you know. So with all this attention, it kind of makes it seem like all these things were never happening before. And now all of a sudden they're happening. And I don't really think that's the case. I think that there's likely a relatively steady ratio of bad things happening to good things that have always been happening since the first person picked up a rock and hit the guy next to him. The difference is now everybody knows about it. I mean, there's so many people in this country that have no idea where El Paso or Dayton are on a map. But now they know that something horrible happened there. And that's what I'm talking about, is that we're so able to focus attention so quickly to the bad things that are happening and it's so scandalous and everyone is so interested to know what's happening. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that it makes people feel like it's happening all the time. And my feeling is, is that it's probably not happening near as much as you think it is. And since no one's really shining a light on all the normal things that happen all the time and people shaking hands and having business transactions happily and meeting new people and having good time together, nobody's, you know, live streaming that to the whole nation certainly doesn't make the news that it makes it seem like nothing but bad thing after bad thing or bad thing are happening. Um, I think the mass shooting as opposed to just bad and violent things happening does seem to be, you know, rising. Uh, I'll agree with that. Um, but again, if it was really the type of epidemic, I know it feels like an urgency for many of the victims or the survivors of victims. There's always an urgency, you know, just like when someone dies of cancer or something like that, everyone in the family is now, you know, giving money to the National Cancer Society and everyone champions cancer as their, as their cause. You know, a lot of people can't stand drug addiction programs and putting money into rehab centers until, you know, their kid brother or their nephew or heaven forbid their spouse, you know, gets hooked on drugs and then all of a sudden it's not all drugies are bad and everybody needs to give money to these drug centers and, you know, tolerance and understanding and cure are the only paths to success. So my point is not that people are hypocritical and self-serving, although it seems like that. <laughs> my, my point is, is that when something affects you personally, often that's when people take up and champion causes because it has affected them. And until it affects you, you're, it's easier to step away and say it's someone else's problem. Uh, I don't know what the solution is to this type of behavior, but I do feel that when this type of behavior occurs, my knee-jerk reaction, and I hope that the reaction of others, is not automatically to say, well, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. That's it. It's over. You know, everything's falling apart. Because I honestly don't believe that everything's falling apart. Look outside. <laughs> Just look outside. Everything is more or less together. Um, and people more or less coexist. If you watch enough news and you watch enough TV, I feel like they do a pretty good job convincing you that there are sides forming left and right and everything's polarizing and, you know, there's a lot of hate going on. What's funny is that I, I heard so many people saying that this was a hate crime uh, that happened in Dayton. And then the police came out this afternoon and they said basically that they couldn't find any evidence uh, that this was any kind of hate crime. Uh, they're not sure what it was. It could have been a crime of passion considering I think the guy killed his own sister um, who was one of the people that was murdered in the area. Uh, so they're saying it might have been a passion type crime. We don't know, a revenge type thing, but the guy showed up in body armor. It wasn't like somebody got angry over hitting on his girlfriend or something. You know, it was it was somewhat premeditated and uh, and purposeful in action. So, you know, when I hear things like that, it's not like all of a sudden people are fighting in the streets. And, you know, this is, this is unfortunately someone who did something that they shouldn't do. And, you know, I think generally people do what they should do. And if you need proof of that, 
just go outside and meet people and talk to people and you'll find out not just that you probably see a lot of things alike but that generally people are coexisting pretty well you know when i think of and this is getting off on a little tangent but when i think of like you know car accidents you know everyone says those car accidents you know you see a car accident but when you think about all the cars going like this at 75 miles an hour or more if you're coming trying to get back from dayton <laughs> 75 miles an hour like that it's a miracle that we don't have accidents every five seconds i mean i think of all the bad drivers i meet at stop signs and they're not hitting each other on the highway you know uh so anyway my point is i think in general uh human beings act in harmony uh, most of us are out for the survival of the species. Most of those, most of us look out for our fellow man in some way. Uh, most of us are not quick to arms. Most of us are not quick to violence. Uh, most of us are quick to resolution, quick to understanding. And um, I think that in times like this, it's easy to think the opposite. And it's easy to have this big call to arms. Everyone has to get band together and, and, you know, have a new look on things. And it's time we finally get together. And I, I don't necessarily take offense to that, but I just don't agree with it. Um, now is not the time to band together and do something grand. We're already doing it. Everyone is already together. There's outliers and there's people who don't want to be part of the system, if you will. And there's people who who want to truly cause harm and death and injury. And um, anyone determined enough to do that probably will, regardless of what laws are in place and regardless of what other things, you know, hinder them from accomplishing those goals. I think anyone who's mostly determined to do that will eventually do that, unfortunately. And the cameras will be right there to catch as much of it as possible. So I just want you to remember that the people and the society we hear all the time the society that you see on your preferred news network whatever it may be is not the whole society that's only the newsworthy portion of society and if you look outside and you look at all the other people around you you'll find that mostly everyone is getting along pretty well and uh, enjoying each other's company to some degree so that's all i have to really say about that that's my take on dayton and i wouldn't have a take on this just like i don't have a take on el paso and i don't have a take on all these other tragedies other than my basic take which is terrible things happen but more good things happen than terrible things already uh, and try to focus on that overall i think focus on the idea that or I focus on the idea that people are generally good and that if it wasn't we would know uh, it would be very obvious there'd be chaos and pandemonium and uprising and it would be you know a living hell out there but it's not uh, so that's all um, hope you all enjoyed the haul uh, you can say what you like in the comments or whatever about any of it uh, I'm not here to debate. Uh, this is how I feel. And uh, there's going to likely be not much that I hear to change that, as most of us are. Uh, but I encourage you, if you feel like you got to get something off your chest, or if you were there and you want to share your side of the, of the experience, then I welcome that, of course, in the comments. Uh, so that's all. Hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, what of it you could. And uh, Bonnet's Bookstore, I still recommend going. <laughs> Uh, it's a great, great little slice of history, and uh, I'm glad it's still there and mostly unaffected. And uh, we'll catch you next time on Bub's Comics, so read a comic. Thanks. Bye.